The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Hunger brought him to life. Swooping down from the mountains on the black rope of the highway, he awoke as though for the first time to the fierce and brilliant sky, to snow on remote peaks that burned but never melted, and pastures that throbbed like green bruises in the crusts of arid foothills. It was like another planet. Around each curve, another alien landscape unfolded, undreamt, spectacular, an angular cliff convulsing against the sky, and in its shadow, his destination. So begins Talion by Mary Maddox. This episode on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. And hello, everyone. This is Michael T. Bradley. And I'm Skix Maddox. And we are back for the eighth episode of Dread Dialectic. And as the opening kind of intimated, we're going to be talking about Talion by Mary Maddox. Uh, let's see, before we jump into anything about the book specifically, I want to just make clear, as usual, that you can reach us at dread.dialectic at gmail.com. And reasons you might want to reach us is to tell us that you uh, really liked an episode, really hated an episode, really agreed or disagreed with an episode. Uh, be sure to let us know why. I would love to hear why people agree or disagree, uh, the points they find most salient or hate the most. And also, another reason is if you have written a horror novella or novel that you think would be really great for the show and you would like us to review, then... We'd love to see it. We'd love to give it a shot, give it a whirl. Um, and we also might do a, a, a listener mail episode somewhere down the line if we get a lot of... No, we won't. We will never... Yeah, we might. I will I secretly do see. one behind your back. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and focus on Talion. The, the reason that I found out about Talion and suggested it is because probably... A, People know, I'm sure I've mentioned it or I've mentioned it or, or, or linked to it at some places. Uh, I have done a fair amount of audiobook narration, and one of the narrators that I work with uh, was involved in putting together some giveaways on this site called instafreebie.com. And so I now am a member or whatever. I get emails from them. Instafreebie.com, the idea is self-published authors will send out uh, stuff. Essentially, you get a free copy of that novel as long as you agree to be put onto the mailing list of the author and then you can you know unsubscribe as quickly as you want or whatever but you get as many free books as look interesting from it they did a horror set right around the time that we were starting this and so i grabbed a bunch um and the ones that seemed interesting uh we're gonna be talking about through this so that's how i found out about it instafreebie.com uh we're not being paid for that or anything just uh if 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 you like reading might be a place to check out. So let's go ahead and, Skix, if you would, do a basic plot outline for Talion here. Okay, Talion by Mary Maddox. She spells her name wrong. <laughs> it's the Damon World Book Zero, according to Amazon. The name Talion is used a lot in a lot of things, but it's actually hmm. a legal term that's related to retaliation or revenge. Interesting. I do not think it's an accident in this case. Makes sense. Basic, basic story. A serial killer with delusions of grandeur, sets his sights on two teenage girls in a small town in... Utah. Oh, right, in Utah, of course. Turns out one of them has these sort of accompanying spirits that sometimes guide her, uh, Talion being the name of the, the chief of these. So we're going to go through, and first we're going to do trigger warnings, but then after that we're going to go through the good, the bad, the ugly, the good, what we liked about it, the bad, what we didn't like... And the ugly is we're going to talk about the monster at the end of the book. It's and, Grover. And, and the, the ugly will... It's not Grover <laughs> in every book. That section will throw down lots of spoilers. We will try to stay away from spoilers for the most part, but, you know. Okay, so uh, trigger warnings. Are there any triggers worth mentioning in well, this? Kind of the skits? standard murder, child abuse, child abuse non-consensual groping. So let's talk about... The good, what we liked. To preface, I generally consider you the more curmudgeon of us two, which is saying a lot. But I seem to be more critical of books that you like. I, I, I didn't like it. There were some moments of interesting writing, like just the way something is worded or phrased, 
that, that I thought were cool. I, I think if I were a writing teacher talking to Mary Maddox, I would explain the concept, kill your darlings about these, because they just sort of pulled me right out of the story, but they're pretty good. Then again, there are some kind of highfalutin moments where she's trying to do that and, and stumbles, like when she said the sky was hazel. <laughs> <laughs> I think I agree with uh, what you're saying in that there was some gorgeous imagery throughout this book and some just beautiful metaphors and just uh, ways of explaining the scenery uh, or whatever that... I was like, wow, I would never think to describe things in that manner. Yes. Just some similes and things like that, that that I thought kicked ass. I never personally found them distracting, though I did think that they fit best from Rad's point of view. Rad is the serial killer. Yeah, he's the guy that talks too much, so, so going on flights of fancy just seems more in character for him. Similarly, his points of view, because the book jumps around to a lot of points of view. His points of view oftentimes made me laugh out loud. They were, I thought, hilarious. The way that he just looked down on everybody and, and hated everybody and was so much better than everybody else. I don't know, like, I had this thing where whenever we get these, like, really overeducated serial killers in books like this, I always laugh because I'm like, you're so right, you're so right. And... <laughs> I really identify with them. Kind of like that he had mommy troubles that made him a little less one-dimensional. Or Did two-dimensional. He? I don't even remember that. He, he, had, he had to call his mother um, a, a couple times, and, and he sort of flashbacked to being pushed out of her bed as a child, something that made him angry about humanity. And it was a little ham-fisted, but it was more than just brilliant professor serial killer. It, it mm. kind of wrapped a little bit around that. There's this bit from the evil stepmother's point of view that I thought kind of summed up a bad way to use it, but also hilarious still. <laughs> I don't know. Let, let me just read it, and then I think I think you'll see why. This is a bit of a long um, uh, quote here, but... Used to be you could have a few Coke and whiskeys without paying for it with this torment. Not anymore. You're old and worn down by life. Sex is like taking a shit for all the pleasure you feel. Wake up every morning with a truckload of shit piled on your chest. A loser husband and a crazy stepdaughter and just enough money to scrape by. Might as well put a bullet in your brain. <laughs> I find that bit hilarious, and I think it's also funny where she's like, uh, sex is just like taking a shit for all that matters, and then it's yes. like, wake up with a pile of shit on your chest, and I was like, wait, 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 from sex? Like, maybe you're just doing it wrong. I, I think Mary Maddox was shoveling it on a bit thick there when she's... I get the feeling she had not ever lived in a trailer and been poor and alcoholic, so she was doing her best. <laughs> well, my, my issue with that segment is it reads perfectly fine as what rad would think that this woman was thinking yeah but it doesn't make any sense from her point of view and I, I i felt like there were a few of those points i don't know if this is good or bad so i'll kind of use this as our segue into the bad but i thought it was interesting the way that she wrote basically everybody just not giving a shit at all times yeah that struck me as a little weird like the final, I don't know, third or so of the book is kind of uh, the girls do finally get kidnapped by Rad, and it's up in the air whether they'll live and yada yada yada. It's like their, what is it, their uh, Lisa's aunt is, is I, I think it's her aunt who she's gone to live with because yeah. of issues at home and she gets uh, sent into the valley of, or into the mountains of Utah to get away from city life and everything her aunt is freaking out and she's like you know something's going on somebody took her and even though they have verified evidence that lisa has been taken and is like been taken in a white van or something the sheriff and the kid she went to the fair with his mom and just everybody is like meh whatever she'll, like i just i don't i don't I, have the energy to care she'll, she'll be to fine I, I don't want to borrow the truck because you know <sighs> It felt like Rad's view of people somehow bled out into reality in this book, mm. which I found amusing, but I also found a little ridiculous after a certain point. Even Lou, who is our presumptive protagonist, 
she tends to be very lackadaisical about things, and unless she's actively being tortured or fucked by her spirit guide. Or entered, I, I should say. We, I don't think it's necessarily that they fucked. Well, aren't we all, really? <laughs> the other problem with that is Hank, the uh, uncle in the situation, suddenly turns into an action hero in the last segment for no apparent reason, because it's like he finds some really, really for sure evidence that they've been kidnapped. And so instead of like calling the police or something, he goes up a mountain trail and finds Rad's van just as it's pulling out. And then he like chases it on foot and then flags down someone in a car and chases them in a car and does all these crazy things with it. And I'm like, this was the guy who like a chapter and a half ago was like, oh, she's probably riding around with those jackasses. I don't want to bother going to look for her. I could totally buy him finding the absolute proof and then being like, shit, I gotta call the police. But him being like, I'm gonna go all John McClane on her ass, like, that just didn't make any sense. And not to me. call the police. Now, this this is in a, a time and place where not everyone has a cell phone, but he was yeah. in a house at the time that presumably had a landline. He could have right. called and then run up the, up the trail. I j that was one of those, like, hey, jackass, call the police. <laughs> Hey, dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it had been playing out in a theater, at least a couple of people would have yelled at the screen. I, I want to read just one sentence that, that just really irritated me. Uh, and then I'll go to things that actually are pertinent to the story. Quote, he used a tire jack to Jimmy the padlock. She doesn't know what at least one of these words means. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's a minor thing. I'm sure if you read my stuff, you'll be able to pick out one thing that stupid somewhere. Sure. And write me about it. I thought Rad, short for Conrad, by the way, and it's sort of presented as a reveal when we find that out, but who the fuck cares? Uh, side note, because I'm full of those. I cannot imagine that particular character being known as Rad. That, that seems odd <laughs> for this superior professor serial killer to go by Rad. Though, to be fair, for most of the book, doesn't he go by James or whatever? Um, I don't think so. I mean, he uses a false he, he name has a few a, times. Yeah, he has the fake name that he's there at the campsite under. Yeah, the Rad thing, I honestly at first thought that he was an evil demon because it sounded like Talion or mm. Black Maria or whatever the other one was. You know, it sounded so... Silly and fake, really? Like it's short. For, like who shortens Conrad that way? I mean, I can sort of see with his with his mommy issues, not wanting to go by his given name. But I think he would go further than that because that yeah. sounds like a surfer or a ninja turtle. <laughs> totally tubular. Okay, so Rat Conrad. Part of the story is, is kind of flashback. He's got this student that he's grooming to be a protege serial killer. Uh, the student's very blue-collar and very doesn't-give-a-shit, which seems to be a recurring theme in the story. Whistler. Whistler. So and, you know, they start going out for beers, and then they have a, you know, you pick up this chick and I'll pick up that chick uh, contest. And Rad, of course, kills his instead of getting laid. Though he might have done both, because that seems in character. Sure. Eventually, Whistler approaches him with, like, Hey, isn't this the girl that you, you went home with that day? With the newspaper of someone who'd been found murdered, uh, and so Rad killed him. Uh, which I think was skipping a couple of steps. I think there's a chance. I mean, I've read Apt Pupil, so so maybe I'm, I'm giving more credit here, but saying to someone, I think you're a murderer, is not automatically saying, and then therefore I should call the police. He should have asked a couple questions before killing him. But then the whole relationship with him reminded me of Jack Torrance and the student in The Shining, where there's just something that, that set him off that wasn't real. I, I didn't like the relationship between Whistler and the professor. It, it didn't feel legitimate. It didn't feel genuine. It felt like it was a backhanded setup for the murder. If somebody was learning the ropes uh, working behind the counter at Kohl's and they figured out oh, you're doing that because of blah, 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 returns have to blah, 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 and, like, they, they figure out three steps ahead, and then you're, like, you're fired. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's a little unnecessary. And the other thing that I thought was weird was everything that put him in Utah. He talks about how he would eventually need to change his identity anyway, and he had been setting up for that, so it's like, we, we didn't need that, you know? We could have had any number of things happen. Whistler could have 
followed him and screwed up his first murder and been put in jail, and so he's like, well, I need to get out of town because of that. Uh, just having it be that Whistler figured it out, and I mean, it's like, isn't that on you for, like, choosing someone who isn't really a good serial killer protege? I mean, you wanted him to know about you at some point, presumably. It's a little awkward, and I'll, I'll say that that actually does bring up one of my big frustrations with this book, is that there are too many flashbacks. Way too many flashbacks. Yeah. You know, we saw this with The Deep. I've discovered this with Anne Rice trying to reread her, and I'm like, oh my god, how did I ever survive through all these flashbacks? Or like, let me tell you the story of how I was born on this farm. It's like, you know what, I, I, does it pertain to, and I don't care, I don't care. <laughs> and there were too many of those in this book. I felt like we would just go to a flashback at the drop of a hat. I remember there's one point towards the end where the abduction has taken place and we we get a point of view from a, the sheriff and i was like oh for fuck's sake we're gonna get a flashback of this goddamn sheriff and we're gonna see like his first case and how he couldn't stand blood or yada 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 right. yada and thankfully i don't think that happens but there were way too many flashbacks i think that's this crutch that a lot of younger or you know younger relatively writers fall on is that things that could be summed up in a paragraph or two or less they're like no i have to do a flashback to show everything about this and it's like save those scenes save those scenes for other characters and other stories down the road yeah and save it for things that add to the story or add usefully to the character to me it's like it's how does this person deal with what's happening to them right now that's what i give a shit about Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about The Ugly. From here on out, spoilers beware. I... The first ugly for me, bad slash ugly, is unfortunately the whole premise of the book series. <laughs> I do not like the daemons. Don't like them. They're, they're hallucinations slash spirits. And there's Talion, whose main attribute seems to be that he's pretty. There's one that seems to kill or want to kill or guide Lou into killing. There are some others that are named, but don't really have any real attributes or, or qualities. I don't think they're necessary to the story. I don't think they make Lou more interesting. I don't think they work as a concept. I don't think that they are developed or used in a way that makes them interesting or necessary. Having Lou just sort of like very lackadaisical in everything except wanting to see Talion again just makes her have less uh, control over her own life, and characters who are entire, entirely passive, I find them not interesting. So this is my number one issue with the book. This book is fucking named Talion. The whole book, I'm like, all right, I am waiting to see Talion unleashed. You know, this is going to be like Unforgiven, right? Where the entire story is about seeing this passive character who refuses to do anything, refuses to do anything, refuses to do anything, and you hear about what a badass they are, and you know that something's gonna let loose, right? And you just, you're waiting for it, you're waiting for it, you're waiting for it, and Talia never fucking does anything. Is absolutely useless through this entire book. If the demons are imaginary, it makes no difference to the story. You could cut them out, doesn't mean anything. Also, the demons are just introduced as kind of a like, oh, and by the way, she saw demons. Like, it's not explained or... She started seeing them after a fever, after being severely beaten by her stepmother, if I'm remembering right. So they, they could be kind of like uh, uh, DID alters, was what I first thought. That's certainly possible. There is never once an indication that they are actually real. The closest that we come is Black Maria, or whatever that one's name is, possibly trying to kill a woman next to her in a bed at the hospital, but the woman is pretty messed up, so it could have just been that she was dying, and Lou imagines her being hurt. I think that scene was intended to verify the reality of the demons, but it's still not entirely uh, definitive. And then there's the whole thing about... It's like, oh, if you say that you love me or whatever it was one more time, then you will have given your heart to me. And it's like, well, why wouldn't he want that? What the fuck is Talion's game here? Could we have any sort of idea of what's going on with him? I, it just, it just, it was like, what use are you guys? And again, maybe this is all dealt with further in uh, the next Demon World book or whatever it is, but it just, it really feels like... Yeah, they have no place in the story. And uh, naming Talion, uh, Talion it, it relates to retaliation and revenge, you would think he would do some of that. 
but what he does is he helps Lou, her stepmother was abducted and killed, and so he gave her guidance on how to cover her departure so that it would seem like she just skipped town. In the long run, that means nothing and does nothing. Right. And I think there was a little guidance later, but, but mostly, like, she was being tortured, she wasn't being helped. The, the bad guy got dropped off a cliff. Not particularly retribution. Yeah, he's such a dud. I mean, he, yeah. he's, he's introduced as, like, this golden light, like, angelic thing, and he's such a dud. I, I came away from the book assuming that Lou was crazy. And she would have every right to be from how she was raised. Sure. Or I, I guess crazy is a bad word. I don't know, ill. Whatever the term. She's ill. Yeah. Yeah, Lou is ill. Um, my other big problem is the pussification eh. of Rad in the last third of the book. Yeah, he was so careful, planned, and tough. He really went down easy. <laughs> he went down easy, and he goes from having these hilarious slash dark and unsettling point of view sections to just annoying run-of-the-mill serial killer sections and then he's got all these things where he's like oh i'm gonna i'm I'm gonna hurt you to the point that you beg me or and i'm gonna force you to beg me to keep hurting you or i'll do something worse to the point where i'm gonna train you and yada 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 and then he seems perfectly content like oh or if you fall off a cliff whatever that's cool too and it felt like uh like with lisa he has like an hour alone with her and kind of like cuts up her face or whatever i think and it just it felt like look this guy seemed to have like these intense machinations that were like gonna call down angels of pain they were so like breakthrough or whatever and instead he just cuts people he'd have like erotic paroxysms just imagining doing that he was, he was one of those guys who, like, on Tinder or whatever, talks a big game and is like, yeah, baby, I'm gonna love you all night, right? I'm gonna teach you all these new positions and shit that you don't know anything about. And then, like, you get over, you watch, like, an episode of Parks and Rec on Netflix, and then, like, what is it? Two pumps, a tickle, and a score, as Stephen King uh, put it. And they're like, okay, baby, have a good night. Man's a poet. Like, it felt like this book was a lot of build-up, no payoff whatsoever. Yeah, I, I think that ties the, the last two things we mentioned, that, that, that it's a failure of payoff. One final note, uh, for me at least. In the end, multiple characters say of Lisa, Oh no, she's not going to be pretty again. It's too bad she didn't die. She's not going to be as pretty as Britney Spears. She should have died. Too bad she would have been better off dead because she's not pretty. Multiple characters say that, and that is so fucked up, and I don't ever want to read that in any book ever again. So any writers out there, you cut that right the fuck out. I mean, I feel like Mary Maddox must be the biggest misanthrope ever, right? Like, just like, oh my god, I fucking hate people. Like, how can I show how shallow and spiteful and terrible they are? And this was, this was what came out of it. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so let's ask the question, would you recommend this uh, to friends or whatever, Skicks? I can't think of any good reason to do so. I think it would be good as a uh, kind of a, a teaching thing. Like you were saying earlier, there, there are some good, really, examples of how to set a scene, how to turn a phrase, things like that. But I would kind of put the big caveat on there, you know, this, isn't, this doesn't lead anywhere. But right. it's, 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 it's well written. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Probably at some point, I'm going to try the sequel out, because I am curious to see, does Talion do something? <laughs> I am still kind of curious, like, what does Talion do? Anything? I would not be surprised if Lou winds up pregnant from Talion. Yeah, and then it becomes kind of a Legion sort of thing. I could I could go with that. And or Virgin Mary, yeah. Legion, the, uh, the old movie with the angels, not the X-Men, not Charles Xavier's son. I enjoyed it, uh, but I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't expect much out of it since it was a free book, right? So uh, um, so maybe that's why I enjoyed it more. Um, uh, but I, I, it came with a fair amount of reservations. But still, overall, you know, I, I say I, I really enjoyed the writing for the most part. It's a basic serial killer story. For all my kvetching, none of it was fatal to the story. It could definitely be be enjoyable. I, it's just not something I would recommend. If you agree, disagree, or have things that you want us to read, shoot us an email, dread.dialectic at gmail.com. Uh, coming up next, a bit of a format change next episode. So be ready for that, everybody, and get excited Ooh. about it. Ooh. 
tell you more when we get there. Uh, For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And this is Skixmatics. And we are...